Well, it, it's, uh, I'm excited for Christmas Eve, and I hope you are too, and I hope you join us. Um, and, you know, Mark was saying how it's a great time for, uh, to bring guests, and one of the things that makes people nervous about coming to church is like, I don't know what's going on. And Christmas Eve services are one of those times where people know almost exactly what's going on because they've heard the songs we're going to sing a billion times. And they've probably heard some part of the Christmas story, even if Charlie Brown told them. They've heard the Christmas story. And so that's what we're going to be doing. And so it's a great opportunity to bring your guests. And uh, I would encourage you as well, like maybe, maybe carpool. Um, and, uh, and at the 10 o'clock, if you're thinking, like, I don't like crowds, 10 o'clock, come to that. Because it's late. And you'll probably have a whole row just to yourself. You can stretch out, take a nap. It'll be great. It'll be great. I won't be offended. Um, but we are in the last uh, week of our Christmas series, Christmas for the World. And part of our Christmas uh, tradition at Creekside is looking to our global partnerships and our local partnerships, recognizing that, that the hope, the peace, the joy, the love that we have in Jesus is not just supposed to stay in this room or just supposed to stay in us, but it's something that we're supposed to share with the world. And so that's why part of what we do is, is look to those partnerships as part of our Christmas missions offering. And there's a brochure in there uh, in the program that that's, uh, you could look through. Um, but we're going to hear from one of our partners today, uh, Chris Goff from Union Gospel Mission. And, uh, and we're excited to, to be hearing from all of these different partners, recognizing that, that Jesus takes us, takes people like us to share his hope, his peace, his joy, and his love. And, and Christmas is that reminder to us that Jesus came to rescue us. Jesus came because God loves us. Jesus came. He was born among us. And he understands what it means to be human as he was fully human and fully God. And how that all works, I don't know. I don't know. It's a mystery. And someday, someday, we'll all understand how that works. But right now, we come to Christmas with this mystery in our hearts and in our minds, and we wrap our, our hearts and minds around Jesus, God with us, Emmanuel. And, and then we take that, that gift of Jesus to the world. And so as we've been walking through ad, uh, at this Advent season, we've been focusing on those four themes that I've said a couple times, uh, just because repetition is the mother of memory. Advent themes are hope, peace, joy, and love. And today we're going to focus on the last theme of love. And love is, uh, is the motivator throughout all of Scripture. Is God's love for his people. And today we're going to have the big idea that God's love for us is expressed in many different ways. And as we read this passage, we're going to read a passage called the Magnificat. It's in Luke 1, 40, uh, 146, and it's Mary's song. And uh, I had great plans for some scripture reader, uh, reader today, um, but uh, she had her baby. And so she's like, can't be here today. Um, and so I asked my wife real quick, who is not having a baby, um, will you read for us, please? And so would you welcome up my wife, Kathy, to, to read uh, Mary's song? And while Kathy is reading, I will light the last candle. It's right here. Oh, you need a microphone. Yeah. It's... Sorry. Hi, friends. There you go. Thanks. <laughs> All right. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, yes, she read. Good. Uh, <laughs> one person clapping. It was great. Um, uh, this song is an interesting song because when you think about Christmas, like nothing in here is like Christmas. 
but it's about God's love for his people. As you look through the history of God's people over and over again, he rescues them. He saves them. And why? Why does God save his people? Because he loves his people. God's motivation throughout the Bible is his love for his people. God's motivation today here is his love for you. God loves you. God sent Jesus because God loves you. And as we think about what Jesus has done for us, we have to hold on to that truth because sometimes, it does, sometimes things feel hard and difficult and not easy. And some, we confuse love with, with making things easy for us. But sometimes we go through hard things knowing that we can endure hard things because God loves us. God's motivation throughout Scripture is his love for his people. And Jesus came because God loves the world. Now, the song that Mary sang is a song that, um, you know, if you just read it, it's like, yes, this is good. It's a good recap of the history of Israel. But, but the story that leads up to this song is quite scandalous. Because Mary was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph. And, and, and God chose her to bear God's son. And I don't, I mean, this is a miracle. This is not how things normally work. But an angel came and said, Mary, you are highly favored. You have been chosen to bear the, the Messiah, the, the, the Savior that has been promised. But because Mary was engaged and, and she was a virgin and, 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 and she's like, I don't know how this is all going to work. But she said, okay, God, I'm going to trust you. And when she told her fiance, Joseph, I'm pregnant with God's kid. How do you think that went? Not great. I mean, we could see this in Scripture because in, in the Gospel of Matthew, Joseph is, is contemplating, like, it, what it says is putting her away, like quietly ending their relationship. He, was, he would take care of her, but, but he didn't want to marry her because he thought that, that she had been unfaithful. But an angel came to, to Joseph and said, no, you're going to marry her. You're going to raise this kid. You're going to name him Jesus, which means God saves. He's the one that you've been waiting for. And Joseph trusted the Lord. But Mary's family, I mean, they might have still had some issues with what was going on. And because she was mysteriously pregnant, they could have killed her and been okay because she had been un apparently unfaithful. And so Joseph and her family, they probably thought, you know, we got to just send her away. And so she goes to a distant relative named Elizabeth. And we talked about Elizabeth a couple weeks ago because Elizabeth was, he, she was very old and she had been unable to conceive and miraculously, God made it possible for her and her husband to conceive a baby who would be named John and John would be the one who would lead the way for Jesus as, as he began his ministry 30 years from this moment. And so they, she goes to Elizabeth far away from her hometown now, try to imagine Elizabeth and, and Mary in this whole situation. Mary might not even know Elizabeth very well, but she's leaving home and maybe has a, a bit of, of, of shame and scandal around her, and she's going to this relative that she doesn't know. What does Mary need at that moment? She does need Jesus. And Jesus is actually in her at that moment, which is interesting. But she needs love. She needs somebody to, to welcome her. She doesn't need somebody to lecture her. Sometimes when somebody is in a, a bit of a, a pickle, a bit of a difficult situation, we have a tendency to say, you know what you need to do is, we get all Dr. Phil on them. Don't be Dr. Phil. There's, there's one too many of those already. But what, is, what does Elizabeth say? And we can read this just before the song of Mary. We can read this in Luke 1.39. It says this. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. 
In a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as I heard the sound of your greeting reach my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promise to her. That's a wonderful response. Here you are, Mary, full of questions and uncertainty and and people trying to put shame on you, but not in my house. You are welcome in my house. And blessed are you because you are trusting the Lord. Mary was hurting. She was, she was probably running for her life. Sometimes we read Bible stories or like we just treat them like they're not real people. But Mary is a real person who had real emotions, who had real struggles. We have to read these stories and put ourselves in their place. She's a teenage, unwed, pregnant mom. What does she need? She needs somebody to love her. She goes to her cousin, Elizabeth, and Elizabeth welcomes her lovingly. Hurting people need to know that they are loved, that they're loved. They don't need to be lectured. They don't need you to solve all their problems right away. They need to know that they're loved. We're coming up on Christmas time. And you might sit down for a meal with some family. And you might be one of the hurting people. And you need love. Or you might be around some hurting people. They need love. They need to know that you love them. Hurting people need to know that they are loved. And God uses people like us to display his love. I find that to be one of the greatest miracles of all time, that broken people like you and me can communicate the wonderful, magnificent love of God. That is a miracle. And how do we do that? Because God shows his love in many different ways. So how do we do that? Well, when we're able to be present with hurting people, not solve their problems, just be with them. We show God's love. When we're able to be generous to help meet the needs of others, we show God's love. When we're able to serve someone or do something for somebody that has no benefit to us whatsoever, that shows God's love. When we bring a meal, take a kid to practice, loan somebody our car so they can go to a job interview, when we sit down and listen to somebody's story, these are all ways that we reveal God's love. When we tell somebody that, that God loves them, we reveal God's love. Love is not an emotion. It's an action. And so we have to actually act on it to reveal God's love. And that's what Christmas is about. It's a reminder to us that God loves us so much that he didn't just have good feelings towards us, but that he sent Jesus to rescue us. He acted on his love. And we, as followers of Jesus today, are invited to act on that love. God loves the world. And it's easy for us to probably say that. Yes, I believe God loves the world. The Bible tells us over and over again, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, amen. Is there an amen there? I don't know, but I usually say amen when I'm done with God talk, right? That's how people are. It's just so ingrained in us. But it's really easy to just say, yes, God loves the world, and we think like the planet Earth and the world. But the world is full of people individuals. And some of those individuals are really hard to love. And I want to encourage us today to recognize that we have work to do to share God's love with those who are hard to love. 
Because God uses us to display his love. And there's a lot of different ways that God displays his love through us. But on your Discover card, there's, there's a couple of, of next steps. And I want to ask you a few questions, and then we're going to have, uh, have Chris join us on the platform to talk a little bit about Union Gospel Mission. But on the back, let's all take out our Discover cards. Um, the first next step says, hard to love. And uh, I would love for us to take a moment to just confess the people that we know that God loves, but we're like, well, that God can do that. But maybe he's saying, no, you need to love them. Who are the people that are hard for you to love? It might be a family member. It might be a coworker. It might be the rich, the poor, people who you would, you would say, well, they're just making those decisions and they're going to have to deal with it. The people who are hard to love. Take it a minute and just write that down. Because we're going to pray for those people. But I want to ask you to write that down as a bit of a confession today. And that you would be praying for these people over the coming days that you would love them and, and let Jesus work in you to transform your heart to help you love them more. It's not easy. But God loves us enough to send Jesus, and Jesus sends us to share that love. And, and maybe today you're thinking, I don't know if I deserve to be loved. Maybe the person who's hard to love is yourself. Write that down. Because God loves you. He loves you. And he knows that you're not perfect. He knows the struggles that you've got, but he loves you anyway. He loves you so much that he came to rescue you right where you are, to bring you into relationship with God. And our whole purpose at this church, our mission is helping people discover, trust, and love Jesus. We exist to share that love of Jesus. And today, if you're not yet following Jesus, this is the best, the best time of year to say, I want to trust Jesus because this is the time where we remember why Jesus came in the first place, to rescue us, to rescue you and me. Today, if you're ready to say, yes, I know I need Jesus, will you mark that on your Discover card where it says, become a follower of Jesus Christ? We want to follow up with you in the coming days and, and answer questions you might have and, and walk this road with you because you do not have to try to follow Jesus on your own. But let us walk with you and, and follow Jesus together. Then I also want to ask if you would be willing to, over the coming days, just to reflect on God's love by remembering Mary's song and, and reflecting on uh, Luke 1, 46 through 55. And that's on here as well. If you would just take some time and just be like, yeah, I want to think about that. Because sometimes we we need to remember how God has revealed his love in the past to look to how God is continuing to reveal his love in the present. And to remember that God is faithful, that he fulfills his promises, and that he walks with us through our difficulties, through our challenges. And so if you would take some time just to reflect on, on that, then mark that on your card as well. Maybe read it over the next week as part of your regular Bible reading, or maybe start your regular Bible reading and just read that song over and over this next week. And part of our practice as well, as I shared, is, is we look to, at this time is looking to our global partners to, and, and throughout we've been looking at how the, the different partners help us see God's work. And so we talked with, um, with the Johnsons about how does their work bring hope to the to Continental Theological Seminary and share the hope of Jesus with the world. How, and we talked to Sean Mills, who's getting ready to go to Spain to, to do media ministries, to meet, uh, meet the, the needs of, of Muslim peoples and help them understand God's peace. And last week, we talked with uh, Mark Rodley, who's going to Thailand, and they're going to be church planting in Thailand, and, and how they are, are working to bring God's joy to the world. And so today, we're going to have Chris Goff join us, uh, and he's talking uh, about Union Gospel Mission. So would you guys welcome up Chris Goff? 
All right, Chris, you brought your Bible, so you're ready to preach. Ready, yeah. All right, I'll go sit down. Do you need this? 50 minutes, you said? Good, five zero. Good, yeah. good, good. All right, uh, Chris, you are with UGM, and so what, yes. what do you do for Union Gospel Mission? We're, we're part of the uh, kind of community engagement arm of the mission. So we, we work with partners, and, and uh, we work with volunteers, and then my role specifically is actually connect with churches in the area, and how do we take the mission of the mission, which is serving those in greatest need, and help the local church to do that in their own context. That's actually what my job is. But as an organization, I'm part of the community engagement piece. Awesome. And so how, how does Union Gospel Mission, because we've had people going and serving, and yeah. we've been partnering with UGM for a long time. So how does Union Gospel Mission reveal God's love to the Seattle area? What well, are some I mean, of the ways? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you just explained it. I mean, I think, I think part of it is um, we, I mean, Americans tend to be pretty materialistic. I mean, we don't see it no. really at this time of year. What? But, uh, <laughs> but, but I think sometimes we think that the solution is material in nature, you know? If we just had socks or if we just had a tent or a shelter. But it's not houselessness, right? It's, it's homelessness. It's mm. a sense of not belonging. Yeah. And so I think when, when we see the work of, of working with those uh, who, are, who are experiencing homelessness, we kind of come from this position of, that's why the word gospel is in our name, is first of all, we believe they have a soul, right? I mean, yeah. there's a starting place of it's not just a material person. It's a, it's a person with a soul, and, and it's a person who um, is isolated, you know? And so in a sense, just like you are suggesting, right, hurt, hurting people need to be loved. I mean, you already gave the solution in your, in your talk. But I mean, I think that is the solution. And so what we've seen is um, it's the building of relationships. So we do meals, right? Like if some of you may get our marketing and, and if you get it, you usually get kind of a lot of it. So sorry about that if you get too many mailers. <laughs> but uh, it's like, hey, for $2, you can give a meal. And, and because everyone knows what it's like to be hungry, everyone knows what it's like to be in that position. But we know that the meal is a bridge for relationship, right? Like the meal is actually an avenue to build a relationship with folks. And uh, it's interesting being in the city of Seattle, uh, the city um, does a lot of good work too, but they don't necessarily have that foundation for the work. Yeah. And so we had a, a, a funny situation where our president was meeting with the city leader and they were driving around the city talking about homelessness and, and uh, they were kind of disagreeing politely because we say, uh, Homelessness isn't a resource problem, it's a relationship problem, right? Broken relationships with family, with, with God, with, with others. And um, so they're arguing and the city leader just said, we just need more housing and housing is certainly important. But we were saying, yeah, they do, but we also need someone to walk with these people, yeah. you know? Who's gonna walk with these people? And the, uh, the, the, the person from the mayor's office was frustrated and they, and they kind of said, well, look at these two people. If they had housing, they wouldn't be out here. Kind of like, hey, the bottom line is we need housing. Hmm. And uh, our president said, with all respect, um, that's Gary and Fred and they're in your housing program, right? Yeah. And it was kind of this moment where, where the city leader was kind of like, oh, there's something beyond this piece. And so what, what is the kind of relational capital? Where is that stored? I think it's the church, right? right? So who can walk with the 12,000 homeless people in Seattle, which is the number right now? Um, well, not, not me and not you. Maybe we could walk with one person together, you know, or maybe the congregation could walk with two or three. But these are folks with high needs and, and uh, folks who've been through a lot of trauma and abuse and neglect. And some of that they've brought on themselves and some of that has been handed to them without their permission, uh, but it takes time. Yeah. And so, um, so yeah, it's this showing up, right? It's, it is the Christmas story, and, and it is showing up in the flesh. It's exactly what Jesus did. He showed us exactly how to do it uh, by being incarnational. And so that's the invitation, I think, when working with those who are in need is, man, how do we get to know them? And we're not Jesus, so we can't save them. Right. And people burn out trying to do that. Um, but those are, those are the, some of the, that's, that's the heartbeat of how to engage this work, you know? Yeah. And so um, uh, we have a distribution center, which is kind of interesting because you guys uh, are connected to the dinner church right. ministries. Yep. And so we do some things where as people give to the mission, we try to give back to ministries that are doing things relationally um, because we've been around since 1932, you know, so we've been around for a while. Uh, a lot of the rescue missions started after the Great Depression, and so, so did we. And so um, as we kind of leverage our marketing, right, sometimes for 
local ministries, local churches. Um, and so, yeah, as people give to us, if we have extra, we quickly give to other folks who are doing things in a relational way. Yeah. Well, what are some of the ways that people can, like, jump in and get involved? Jump in? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I set up a little table. Well, somebody else set up a table for me. Thank you. But we put some stuff on the table out here. And I'm, I'd be happy to chat with you after. But, you know, there's really, um, obviously, you could donate to the mission. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, we had a, a, I don't know if you saw in the news, but we had a lawsuit against us because of our hiring practices this year and have lost a lot of donors and people who normally have given to us. So that is definitely something that is always needed. But yeah, donating, volunteering, and, um, and partnering are kind of the three ways we think about it. And so partnering being maybe you have a business that would like to do something, or maybe you would be willing to hire somebody who's gone through our program. Um, uh, but I can talk to you about those things out there, but uh, do, a, do a sock drive. Socks are the number one need, always. Yeah. We, we always need them. Uh, it's kind of the, when we go out and talk to folks, that's what, that's what they want is a pair of fresh socks. So. Um, it's also kind of usually what I want for Christmas, so it kind of makes sense, yeah. you know. Nothing like a clean pair of socks, uh, <laughs> brand new. Um, but but those are those are some of the key ways I think that you could engage. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Well, we are um, happy to be a part of what you're doing, and UGM is a part of our Christmas missions offering, and has been for the last several years, and even today. Like if you're a guest, if you're here for the first time, you're helping, uh, and you tell us on your card, you're helping people five dollars at a time. That's why we brought all four of our kids today. Perfect. Yeah. You know what? <laughs> Fill them out. Yeah. I, you know, go for it. We're happy to, to, to partner with $20. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, but yeah, we are just so grateful for UGM. I'll take that. And, uh, and the work of, uh, of the mission. And so give Chris a hand, guys. So if you are curious about more, uh, please talk with Chris. He'll be out in the lobby. Um, but... Union Gospel Mission will change your life. Going and serving, and I'm looking around, I see people who go and serve regularly in the room today. I mean, you're going back because you're building relationship. The reason we do dinner church uh, is the same reason. Like, people are hungry, and we can have a relationship with them. We can provide a meal for them. But, but all of it is because we want them to know God's love. And who does God use to send his, his messengers of love? Us. He uses us. And so I want to encourage us this year, this Christmas, to, to be intentional as we carry the message of love to our families, to people who are hurting. And one of the things that we often come across is when people see these problems in our community, we would like, oh, someone's got to solve that problem. But these are not problems to be solved. They're people to be loved. And whether or not somebody is homeless or they're just grieving or they're, like, they're hurting through some decisions that they made, and maybe it's somebody sitting across the table from you this next couple days. Love them. Love them. Be intentional. Welcome them. Listen to them. And as we share the love of Jesus in these, as Chris said, incarnational ways, the love of Jesus with flesh on, people will see Jesus in us. And maybe we'll have the opportunity to say, you know, the reason I'm doing this is not because I'm just so great. It's because Jesus is so awesome. And Jesus revealed his love to us, ultimately not through being born, but about 33 years after Jesus was born, he laid his life down on the cross to to rescue us from the greater problem, the greatest problem of all that every single person has, is is that we are prone to sin. And Jesus came not to defeat our military enemies or our political rivals. Jesus came to defeat the greatest enemy that all of humanity has been wrestling with, sin and death. Jesus, on the cross, took our sin. And he died the death that we should have died so that we could have the life that Jesus deserves. 
Jesus did that for us. And part of our practice on Sunday mornings is to remember what Jesus has done through communion. And I'm going to ask the band to join me on the platform and those who are serving communion to find their places. Communion is, is a practice. It's a symbol for us of, of Jesus and his death and his, his rescuing work on our behalf. And there's a piece of bread which represents his broken body. And in his brokenness, we find healing. And that healing is maybe, we could think of it healing this way, laterally, with people who maybe we have some hardship. Maybe the names that you wrote down, the people who are hard to love. This is a time to examine our hearts and to say, Lord, who have you called me to love? Who do I need to share this hope with, this love with, this peace with? And maybe while you're standing in line, take some time to, to reflect on that and ask Jesus to help you to love them well. There's also a, a, a cup of juice, which represents the, the blood of Jesus. And this this blood of Jesus symbol, symbolism, it's, it's, it's in the Bible when they would sacrifice an animal, it was because the sacrifice was taking the place. Their life was taking the place of the, the person offering the sacrifice. It was a substitute. Jesus on the cross is our substitute. And through his sacrifice, he washes us clean. And so where the bread is maybe helps us remember the lateral relationships, the, the cup helps us remember the vertical relationship between God and us. And while you're in line, or after you come back to your seat, take some time and ask the Lord, what is in my heart that might be interfering with our relationship? Are there any sins or anything that, that I need to confess and offer those up to Jesus? And maybe today you're saying, I don't know Jesus at all. This is the best day. This is the best day to say yes to Jesus. And if you are ready to say yes to Jesus, let us know on your card. But also, there's going to be some people in the back of the room who would love to pray with you today. They would love to pray with you for anything, but they would really love to pray if you are saying yes to Jesus today. And so when you come and you receive the elements and go, let them know that, that you are saying yes to Jesus as well. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask us all to, to hold our Discover cards. And, and where it said, where you wrote down the p person who's hard to love, let's, let's just start that work of, of asking the Holy Spirit to help us love well as we prepare our hearts for communion. Lord, we thank you for your uh, amazing, overwhelming love for us. And Lord, I pray as we, as we consider the names that we wrote down, as we consider the people that, that, that are hard for us to love, Father, we pray that you would overwhelm our hearts with your love, that you would fill us so that your love would overflow out of us, even towards people who are hard to love, whether it's family members or coworkers or a friend who's hurt us, or, or, or Lord, if it's people who we disagree with politically, people who are rich or poor, whatever, Lord, whoever is hard for us to love, help us to, to share your love and to love well. And Lord, for those who are saying yes to you today, Lord, we ask that your love would be what draws them to relationship with you. That your love would transform their hearts and their lives. That your love would, would lead them into a, a, the path of, of life. And so Lord, we pray all of this for your glory. And as we remember, Jesus, that you laid your life down for us, Lord, we thank you for your love. And so help us today to be beacons of love in this world, constantly pointing back to Jesus and his love for us. For your glory, Lord. Amen.